Hello, AP Biology students, and welcome to the first summer assignment lecture. You can speed through this as you see fit. It should follow your study questions fairly closely, so please pay attention. All right, so basically biology, for those of you who have not had it yet, and those of you who have not had it in a while, we are talking about the study of life and when we are looking at the principles of living systems, we are going to see two main things that kind of encompass all of biology. First, everything is going to be a combination of the living systems, which are going to be the biotic systems, and the non-living or the abiotic systems. We see this in the nutrient cycles in particular, which we will be talking about very near at the beginning of the school year, and also how everything plays out in terms of energy. When we look at life, when we look at the continuance of life, everything really goes back to energy at some point because it is energy that drives biological systems being able to thrive and continue. When we look at these systems, especially in biological systems, everything is going to exist in a hierarchy, meaning that there are different levels. We are not just people, we are made of organ systems. Our organ systems are made of organs, which are made of tissue, which are made of cells, which are made of molecules. But we also have another hierarchy. We aren't just individual people, we are populations which make communities, which interact with other populations inside of ecosystems on the planet in the universe. So everything builds, <clears throat> interacts, and makes everything very, very complex. And everything is going to be interconnected at some point. So when we look at this picture, <clears throat> we can see different living systems. We can see the trees, the grasses, the giraffes, but we also see some of the abiotic things coming in, particularly the sunlight coming in <clears throat> here. Also the heat giving off as things consume energy. And you've got the air, you've got the water, you've got the soil, and all of these things coming to make a very dynamic system <clears throat> that makes up life. Okay, so what makes something alive? I'm using quotation marks because these characteristics that we use to describe life, they are developed and clarified by scientists based on the living things that we have come to know and encounter on Earth. There might be extraterrestrial life, and if there is, it may differ from what we know. But the basic definition of life so far is that there has to be some type of order, usually at least one cell, if not more, such as us, um, and there has to be some mechanism in that cell to pass on its characteristics, and that is typically going to be DNA, passed down from one generation to the next, either asexually or sexually, um, so the traits of that living system can continue. So your cells, you can see you've got your chromosomes right here. You've got spindle fibers. This is your general mitosis mechanism. So that is your basic minimum characteristic, at least one cell that can split its DNA and then separate into two cells and therefore meeting all the characteristics of life. Your basic types of cells, you've got your cells without a nucleus, that would be your prokaryotes, that would be your bacteria, and your archaea. The archaea are also bacteria, but they are the ones that live in really harsh environments like hot springs and um, acidic environments, very salty environments. And then you've got your eukaryotes, which have a nucleus housing the DNA. And then the eukaryotes have lots of other organelles that the prokaryotes don't. And when we get to that, we will be more specific about those differences. 
everything that's alive has to have some type of energy utilization. The energy that is used will either be chemical, so for us, that would be things like carbohydrates and fats, sugars, proteins, or it could be electromagnetic, that would be your photosynthesizers, your plants, etc. So these would be your phototrophs or your autotrophs, your self feeders using light, and then these are your heterotrophs. things that have to eat other things. Now the thing about energy utilization, you must have energy coming in from outside of yourself. So even if you are a self feeder like a plant, you are not making your own energy, you are just making your own food. So you have to have the input of energy outside. You cannot internally generate your own energy and be self-sustaining. That is going to be one of the key principles um, about staying alive is maintaining the input of energy. All living things should respond to the environment in some way. A rock does not respond to the environment. It will warm up, it will cool down, but that is not a response. Um, a response such as a physiological response would be something like goosebumps. When you are getting cold, the tiny muscles at the base of the hairs on your arms and legs will then begin to contract, making the hair stand up. And that is an evolutionary holdover from our ancestors that had a lot more hair and they could puff up their hair and trap heat against their bodies. A behavioral response, um, this would be something like an aggressive response of a dog to another dog or a stranger or two male betta fish when they see each other they puff out their gills and they fan out their fins and then they start attacking each other to defend their territory an innate behavior that is something that is instinctual and then a learned behavior obviously is something that an organism will learn over time Morphological responses to the environment, that would be something like a dog or a cat growing thicker fur for the winter in response to the change in the season. And then over time, you can have evolutionary changes um, such as Darwin's finches, beaks changing in response to the types of seeds that are present during the seasonal changes. So these are things that have to occur and you have to be able to respond to the environment. Otherwise you will die. And if you die, you don't spread your genes to the next generation and you get wiped out. One of the main things that living systems must do is you must maintain the internal environment. And this is known as homeostasis. So homeo meaning same. And different organisms have different tolerances. So if you were to go up to the Arctic, that might not be great for you, but a polar bear is just fine. Take the polar bear, put it in the rainforest, it's not gonna do well. It's actually going to dramatically fail in that environment. One of the things that people often say about homeostasis, it's maintaining balance. One of the things that we will learn over time is that in biology, balance is bad. You may have a home life work balance to maintain like some emotional, psychological sanity, but balance in terms of biology, that is death. <clears throat> you must constantly be putting energy into your system. If you are not constantly putting energy into your system, then everything inside of your cells will become nice and equal and balanced. That is called equilibrium. And when that happens, your cells stop making energy and you die. So balance, equilibrium is death. So homeostasis is actually fighting equilibrium all the time. Some of the mechanisms for homeostasis are going to be positive and negative feedback loops. 
A negative feedback loop is where a certain condition or stimulus is going to cause the organism or a system to respond in such a way that it counters the environmental stimulus. For example, when you go outside and it's really hot, your body starts to heat up and then your body says, I'm getting too hot, we need to cool down. So you start sweating and then as the sweat evaporates from your body, it is removing heat in order to counteract the environmental stimulus. So the reason it's called negative feedback is because it is opposing the stimulus to counter it to, or to negate it. It's not that it's a bad thing, it's just doing the opposite. You get too warm, your body tries to cool itself. You get too cold, your body tries to heat itself up by shivering. In Inside the cell, you've got lots of different metabolic processes. So here, we're going to start with chemical A. Chemical A will be changed into B by enzyme 1, which then is changed into C, which then is made into the final product, D. So a cell will continue to do this as long as A is present and these enzymes are active. However, Doing all of this requires energy, and if you have enough of product D that you don't need to make any more of it, it is beneficial to the cell to turn that off. So in many metabolic processes, the product, when it gets to a high enough concentration, will actually bind to enzyme 1, or whichever enzyme in the metabolic pathway, and it'll inhibit it, or it'll turn it off, so the whole mechanism, this whole thing, then shuts down until all of D is consumed. Once all of D is consumed, enzyme 1 will become active again, and the process will continue. It's just like a thermostat in the house. <clears throat> Once the house has gotten to a high enough temperature, the thermostat shuts off the furnace. Once the house cools down again, the thermostat kicks on the furnace, and it keeps it going back and forth and back and forth. That is a negative feedback mechanism. A common negative feedback mechanism in the body is the regulation of blood sugar. And so if you eat a big bowl of pasta and your body is digesting the starch, it is going to generate lots of glucose, which is a simple sugar. And as that glucose enters into your blood, your blood sugar level is going to spike. That is going to be sensed by the body, and then your pancreas is going to release the hormone insulin into your body. And that is going to come from some specialized glands called the islets of Langerhans. And the islets of Langerhans actually have two types of cells. They have alpha cells. The alpha cells secrete glucagon, that's an alpha symbol, not a weird fish. And they also, and then the beta cells secrete insulin. So whenever your blood sugar is high, the pancreas secretes the insulin, and then the insulin stimulates your tissues in your body to absorb the glucose. Your muscle cells will absorb it. Your fat cells will absorb it. Your liver cells will absorb it. And then your liver and your muscles will start storing it as a complex carbohydrate called glycogen, which is basically the animal form of starch. All of those processes then lower the blood sugar. So you had high blood sugar up here. The insulin causes all of these things to happen. So you get a lower blood sugar. So let's say then later you go out and you start running. <clears throat> You've got a certain amount of glucose in your blood, in your muscles, and as you're running, your muscles use up all of that energy. So then what happens? Your blood sugar starts to drop, and that is sensed by the body again. <clears throat> but instead of insulin, the pancreas is going to release glucagon, 
and the glucagon will then go to the liver and it's going to take this glycogen and it's going to break it into glucose and that glucose is released into the blood to travel to your cells so that it can then be used to generate um, energy for muscle contraction and then if you use up all of your glycogen stores then your body will start breaking down fat and then if you are so depleted of energy and fat stores and sugar stores then your body starts breaking down protein but that's long term and happens with starvation but these are all forms of negative feedback if you've got high blood sugar your body's going to lower it using insulin if you've got low blood sugar your body's going to raise it using glucagon and these are called antagonistic because they work against each other just like the antagonist in a story works against the protagonist positive feedback is the opposite of negative feedback positive feedback doesn't mean that it's necessarily good what it does is the stimulus produces a response which then makes more of the same stimulus so in this diagram what we see because we got a different met metabolic pathway, <clears throat> W is being converted down finally into Z. And then what the product Z does is it stimulates this enzyme to make even more Z. A realistic example of that is what happens in labor <clears throat> when a woman is pregnant and she comes to term, or maybe she is beyond term and has gone past her due date and they need to induce labor, um, the body either starts producing the hormone oxytocin or it is injected into the woman to induce labor. And what oxytocin does is it causes the uterus to contract. And then when the uterus contracts, that causes more oxytocin to be secreted. Well, that extra oxytocin then causes the uterus to contract a little harder, which then secretes more oxytocin, harder contraction, more oxytocin, harder contraction, and that keeps going and going. So then the contractions start getting closer together and stronger, and then eventually they are strong enough and close enough together um, to push the baby out of the uterus. And then the most beautiful and horrifying thing that happens to the human body is birth. Uh, if you've ever not, if you've never seen a video of human birth, I don't know that I would recommend it, but it's very educational. But that's a positive feedback because it increases the stimulus until it gets to an end point. In the world, a very large example of positive feedback, and this is a clear example of when we say positive, it's not good, um, is climate change. <clears throat> so we've got CO2. CO2 increases the thermal shielding of the atmosphere, makes the atmosphere more dense, it captures energy, reflects it back to the planet, makes it warmer. And so as the global temperature increases, we begin to see um, an increase melting of the polar ice. Polar ice has a high albedo effect. Albedo means it is reflective. So it being white, it reflects sunlight and back out into space. However, when the polar ice melts and the land underneath is exposed, the land is darker, so it absorbs more heat and makes the planet warmer which then melts more ice and exposes more land and on and on and on. As the temperature increases, that also increases the rate of decomposition. Decomposition is then going to release more CO2, which is then going to make things warmer. And as things get warmer, we like, <clears throat> we like things to be nice and air conditioned, but air conditioning typically requires the burning of fossil fuels, which then 
increases your CO2, and then the problem gets worse and worse. So um, you could solve that with solar power, nuclear, hopefully nuclear fusion will come along someday and solve all of our energy issues. Or you could help solve some of this issue by increasing your thermostat a few degrees instead of it being like 68 in the house, make it 70 or be crazy, go to 74 or even 76 and wear some shorts and a t-shirt. Save the planet, be a little uncomfortable. All right, moving on. What else is going to make characters of life growth and development? You did not start out the size you are. That would have been a very painful birth for your mother. Um, you started out as a single cell. <clears throat> you went through mitosis a whole bunch, and then you hit puberty, and there's some more things going on there for development, and things grow and they change. Um, and that's important for reproduction, and that's important for adaptation and evolution, but they are not the same. <clears throat> Um, the question is, does growth and development violate the second law of thermodynamics? Some of you may be going, um, I don't know what the second law of thermodynamics is. So first law of thermodynamics is you have to get energy outside of yourself. And the second law of thermodynamics is that every change of energy is going to be less than 100% efficient and add disorder to the universe. So if we keep adding order, <clears throat> is that violating that second law of thermodynamics? And the answer is no, because the amount of chaos that you generate in order to grow and develop, um, you add more disorder than order. So you do not violate the laws of the universe by going through puberty. All right. All right. Reproduction, things that are living in order for them to continue must at some point reproduce and pass on their genes. That can be done asexually, meaning one parent giving identical offspring for the most part. Um, so and like when a strawberry plant grows, here's a strawberry plant, it will put off these runners. And at the end of that, there's a little baby plant. And then it puts off another runner with another little baby plant. If you cut these runners, these little baby plants will put down roots and they will be genetically identical. Um, so that would be a very clear example of asexual reproduction. There are some animals that carry out asexual reproduction. Some of them will grow and they will bud off. If there's a worm, you cut it in half, it grows into two worms, that's asexual reproduction. But then there is something called parthenogenesis, which is very interesting. And this is where a female will give birth or lay eggs to a clone of itself. <clears throat> so this is very um, clearly seen in aphids. They are a pest bug. And the females will lay clones of, no, will not lay eggs, they will give live birth to clones of themselves. And then those clones are already pregnant with clones of themselves. So their populations grow very, very quickly. Some lizards and some birds, the females can lay eggs that have clones of themselves inside of them. And that's a mechanism to increase the population size when there aren't many males available. And so now you have more females who then potentially can spread out into the ecosystem to find those males and then you can have sexual reproduction. There is a form of parthenogenesis where essentially um, the female is both mother and father and through a weird meiotic process her gametes will then fuse back with themselves um, to create an offspring, but it's not necessarily genetically identical because of how the gametes sort in meiosis. But it's still, a, I mean, it's kind of asexual, but at the same time, it's not because they're two different gametes. So, but it's still parthenogenesis. And of course, 
sexual reproduction uh, to parents, typically egg and sperm, giving um, genetically different offspring. There are no set rules in <clears throat> reproduction in biology. Um, it's not always an X and a Y chromosome for male or an X and an X for females. Uh, it's not always egg and sperm. Um, it's and even in mammals, you can have um, some different situations. So, um, and we'll get into a lot of those different things that are really interesting um, later on in the year. And then, of course, we have evolution. This is the change in the genetic structure of a population, not an individual, over time so that they will adapt to the environment. Um, and then we'll do lots and lots on evolution later. So when we look at this, we can see here the inside of a sunflower, lots of order and structure, evolutionary adaptation of this little um, seahorse looking like the coral behind it, response, the environment, etc. And then here this um, desert hair, the giant ears. You can, if you can see closely, you can see the veins um, in the arteries in the ears. That's for heat dissipation to help them cool down. Um, and that is an evolutionary adaptation that helps them with homeostasis. All right, so life then, as I said before, is a hierarchy. So we start down at the basis of atoms such as carbon. Carbon binds with other carbon molecules and other atoms to form molecules. There are all kinds of molecules, um, biological, non-biological, we'll get into all of that later. Those molecules then come together to form organelles, nucleus, membranes, etc. Those organelles form cells. That's your individual smallest unit of life right there. And then your cells form tissues. So <clears throat> these tissues, what makes it a tissue is that those cells are working together for a common purpose. So muscle tissue for contraction, nervous tissue for communication, sensing, perceiving, and then of course vascular tissue for transporting things. Those all come together. So you can take all of these those could make something like a heart, which looks nothing like that, but for the sake of simplicity, that gives you an organ. And then the organs, so you take the heart, you take the arteries and the veins and the capillaries, that gives you the circulatory system. Um, and then your organ systems are put together to give you an organism. So that's one large macroscopic um, system, which then interacts with other things of its species, making a population. And then the populations interact with other populations. So the people populations interact with the cat populations, and that gives you a community which interacts with the plant communities, giving you an ecosystem. And then you've got the whole range of the biological hierarchy. And then all of your ecosystems make up your biosphere, which is the planet, and then the universe after that. So your biosphere going down to your temperate deciduous forest, which is the biome that we live in here. <clears throat> you see a community of bears and trees, and then you see that the trees making up a population of the individual tree, that's your organism. Then the organism is made up of organs. So a leaf is a plant organ. The other types of organs for plants are things like stems and roots and flowers. Um, fruits are organs as well. In fact, fruits are the matured ovary wall from a flower. So when you eat fruit, you're eating ovaries. You're welcome. And then inside of that leaf, you've got different tissues. You've got photosynthetic tissue. You've got vascular tissue. You've got epithelial tissue. And then you've got the cells, chloroplast here for your organelle. Inside of that, you've got the chlorophyll molecule, 
Um, this is the part that's going to absorb light and channel it into that central um, atom there to excite electrons. Stop talking about photosynthesis, it's my favorite thing. And then, of course, that's made up of atoms of carbon, etc. And that gives you the whole system and range of life. Now, as you proceed from atoms to molecules to organelles, each step is much greater than just the parts that make it up. So what the organelle can do is much greater than just what the molecules can do. And what the cell can do is much greater than just what each type of organelle can do. And this is what's known as emergent properties. Or as you increase in complexity, the higher level com of complexity is able to do much more than just the sum of the parts. The interactions um, and the relationships that form become greater and more and more complex. And that's going to be a critical thing <clears throat> that we will kind of draw together um, towards the end of the semester is making all of those emergent property um, connections. And so this back to this picture, it's not just giraffes eating trees, it's going to be light coming in, it's the trees taking in CO2 and producing oxygen, it's the animals eating and pooping, digesting, reproducing, competing, everything. It's very, very complex, and of course we're just looking at the stuff up here, but then there's all the relationships of what's going on in the soil, the stuff that's going on in the sky, at the cellular level, at the organ level, so everything is very tight, complex, and that's biology, and I'm getting excited because when you understand the complexity, it gets very, very fun.